Hi everyone, I'm Graham Ogle and uh, I won't go into what I do, I know most of the people in the room and by the end of this morning you'll know a lot more about me. So um, what I want to do is uh, I'll be introducing the speakers and I'll also be giving my own presentation. Uh, the next two speakers are people who have been involved with the development of this technology. Um, and then I'll, I'll speak because I'm also involved with the technology. Um, so um, I, I think what we're looking at here is it's an incremental uh, improvement to a technology that I think when we get there, it's going to change the paradigm about how we do things. I think it's going to free up a lot of uh, energy uh, to be able to explore different ways to help farmers innovatively with the decisions they're making. So I'd, I'd like to now introduce uh, from LIC Grant Anderson. Uh, Grant led the R&D team, uh, but there is also a marketing team behind Grant and also a development team, both in the R&D space and when you got it all sorted, you handed it over to a commercial team, which uh, powered into it and turned it into a commercial product. Um, so, um, Grant, uh, I'll leave the floor to you, and you'll, I'll pull your presentation up. There we go. Right, and what do we do there? Thank you, Grant. Good morning. Um, so I followed Graham's directions as well, which means that you'll notice, let's not call it some of the same bits, let's call it thematic resonance instead, <laughs> with some of the things that Bruce said. So I've been asked to talk about um, space, where we've been and where we're planning to go from here. And I guess to start with, it's what is our overall vision for space? And so that ties back to LIC's overall in, um, vision of empowering livestock farmers with genetics and technology. Obviously, this falls more into column B than column A. And in the particular case of space, um, to enable farmers to manage pasture well. Um, and so through space, the way we're doing that is minimising the time and labour they spend on measuring the pasture which gives them the information and time they need to manage that pasture. So that said, um, where we, this all began was back at the start of 2016, um, Simon Parry, who was in this very room, met up with a representative of a company called Farm Shots, whose reason to exist was taking satellite imagery and processing it for third party use and that was mainly to do with crop health over in the states um, but when these two met they thought what if we could use this for measuring pasture and that's where it sort of kicked off about um, a year later we were doing a proof of concept on canterbury so Prior to that, there was uh, quite a bit of work behind the scenes, um, getting satellite imagery, working on sort of dry matter equations, can we actually do this? So in early 2017, we met with the higher ups at LIC and said, we think this has legs. And they looked at our results and said, we think it has legs too, let's go ahead with it. And that led to a commercial release in Canterbury at the end of that year, after a bit more data wrangling. Um, so we went with a, a regional rollout. We know there's a bit of difference between the regions in New Zealand and we wanted to make sure we were okay in each of those regions before releasing. Canterbury was sort of the low-hanging fruit. It's nice and flat and it's got irrigation. It's reasonably consistent in terms of what's happening on the ground. And then over the next two years, we would gradually um, roll out over the whole country. Um, and yes, two years. Um, there were a few hiccups along the way. Um, so there was, things went well for the first few months. It was around um, the winter of 2018 where we started to encounter, let's call it suboptimal accuracy issues um, with, with the space system. And so there was, and again, I'm going to not use the word frantic, but there was some 
um, highly impelled investigations into what was going on. And it wasn't any one thing. There were a few factors at work there. And you can see them in the picture and also um, down the side of that slide. Um, and so the first of these is shadow. So um, we're talking about winter now, the satellites, so the, the planet satellites pass over um, in the sort of 9.30 to 11.30 in the, in the morning range. And that means that in winter, uh, you can still have some quite long shadows on the ground when the, the satellites are coming across. And the effect of these shadows was to depress the pasture measurements within those areas. And so what we needed was a way to um, mask out those bits, but we couldn't just say anywhere that has low pasture in the system is a shadow because obviously it's not low pasture, it's sometimes just low pasture. So we got a system, it, it managed to mask out the appropriate shadow bits. You can see in the image there, there's a dry matter view on the left and there's a shadow view on the right. Not everything that is low pasture in the dry matter view is shadowed on the right, it's working as intended. Um, cloud is also a perennial foe of a satellite-based system. And so in the beginning, we were using the cloud mask provided by Planet, what they called unusable data mask, or UDM. Um, you can see in the picture at the top, we've got the actual um, sort of photo image of the cloud, the red, green, blue image. And there's a fairly hefty amount of cloud in that image. Planet's cloud mask is in the image below that. Um, the brown and white portion there is what they designate as cloud. But you can see that not only is there cloud in the image, there is cloud shadow in the image, which um, we've talked before about the effect of shadow. It's not great. Um, so there was room for improvement. And so we took a publicly available um, cloud detection model, and then we um, modified um, the output a bit for New Zealand um, data um, compared to the space system, and then we used that. And it turned out that that was still not perfect, but better than what we were getting from the planet system. And you can see that in the bottom image, it's actually picking up some of that cloud shadow. Not quite all of it, but it's still better than it was. Um, where we are now with that is um, Planet have released their UDM2 technology, um, and that turns out to be a substantial improvement on one. So that's where we are with that. It also has the ability to detect such things as snow, which hasn't been directly relevant to us yet, particularly in the North Island, but who knows? Um, these are unsettled times. So those three factors all together um, gave us what I call space 2.0. I may be the only person calling it that, but I, I try and slip it into these talks and maybe it'll be a thing. Um, and then the surface reflectance, the third change, wasn't actually anything we did. Well, I guess it was to some extent, but it was actually a new post-processing that Planet were doing on their data. So we took that and incorporated it and we had to make a new um, dry matter model to take it into account. But effectively, the difference is between an image taken um, with top of atmosphere reflectance, which is the bottom one there, and one taken with the surface reflectance correction, which is the top, there's a fairly substantial difference between them, and that was reflected in the accuracy of our results. And implementing those fixes addressed the issues that we were seeing in that winter, and um, there was much rejoicing. <laughs> so. That sort of brings us to where we are now. So in late 2018, we had our first meetings with Rosier uh, around um, using the pasture growth forecaster. Um, through 2019, um, we were developing that integration within R&D. Um, in early 2020, we were not so much handed that over as sort of went with it over to technology and started that implementation process off. And September was Space 3.0 release. Um, which is the pasture growth forecaster integrated version. And so um, I guess that's the reason we're here now. So what led us to version three was, I've got here accuracy and frequency challenges, but I think um, people are pretty aware of what leads to those frequency challenges. Um, the satellite can't see through clouds. That means that you can't get reports on cloudy day, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> You can't get reports on cloudy days, and if you're in an area that 
doesn't see a lot of sunny days, that's going to be an issue for you. And so as part of this work, we may have um, taken a quick gander at the, the various regions of the country that we were getting more and less um, reports for. Um, I was tempted to say something like, the answers may surprise you, but I don't think they would. Um, so can't see through clouds, that's an issue. Um, and then spectral saturation as well, which is not as obvious a problem unless you've actually been on the system. But um, because of the way the satellite cameras pick up what's happening on the ground, um, that you get saturation in some of the spectral bands. And what that results in is what we called internally the top end drop off. So as the pasture gets higher, the response of the system to higher pasture diminishes and you get sort of an, an elbow shaped graph like that one. So obviously farmers kind of notice when the, everything's fine up to about 3,000 and then everything above that just sort of looks like it has that same value. And the other thing that ties back into frequency is that it wasn't just how many reports they were getting, but the regularity with which they were getting them. And so given that the issues here were with the satellite camera not being able to see through clouds, and the satellite camera having issues of spectral saturation, the idea was to bring something in that wasn't actually a satellite to solve this problem. Um, and that brings us to space 3.0. So we get out of that new online reports, nothing to do with the uh, sort of R&D data processing side of things, but much more convenient for the farmers. And so one of the new online reports can look like this. So the pink bars mean that these are estimated values. They're coming from the PGF uh, pasture growth forecaster, but based on the most recent satellite data plus adjustments from the PGF. And you can see that the map there doesn't look quite like your normal space map. There's no sort of within paddock variation, and that's because the estimates that we get um, from the growth model are at the paddock level. So we've just got a monotone for each paddock there. So not just predictive reports, but the ability to give regular predicted reports. If you want um, a report every seven days, we can do that now. Um, we've also addressed the saturation issue to some extent. So where we um, estimate that a paddock is being saturated, then we can substitute a PGF result in across that. And as you can see from the graph, that makes things better, not perfect. That's more or less an ongoing theme of every presentation I have to give at the moment. But um, it's better than it was. It is reaching some of those upper um, pasture levels now, and that's encouraging. And that leads us to being able to present mixed satellite and model reports, where we've got the satellite um, values for paddocks that have satellite readings, and we've got the PGF values for paddocks that appear to be saturated. And so that's the current state of the system. Um, and I guess from there, um, deft segue, where we're going next. So space 4.0, um, the idea is capturing grazings. So um, the idea of the growth model is being able to let us go long periods of time without a satellite image in those areas that are heavily overcast. Um, the accuracy of the PGF will diminish over time, and not because of any flaw in the PGF itself, but just because it doesn't know when grazings are happening on farms. So the, the more days you go without a satellite image to reground the PGF, the more inaccurate things are going to get. Um, so to fix that, you need grazing information. Um, to get grazing information, one option is farmer entry. So that is not ideal. You don't want the farmer to be doing any more work than they have to. Um, at a Grasslands Conference last year, someone mentioned um, farmer entry as the source of grazing information for what they were doing, and the room rocked with laughter. Um, their opinion was that this was something that was unlikely to occur. So, um, But there are other options. So our research engineer, Pete Cross, has been working with uh, people from Dairy and Z, um, hi Mark, on um, GPS collar technology. So slap a few GPS collars on cows, track the location, you've got grazing details. Um, another potential option is satellites that are equipped with radar. Um, we speculate that it may be possible to detect whether paddocks have been grazed using um, radar-based systems and just reground things in that way. Uh, so consistency between satellites is another big thing. Um, when we began, we had Sentinel, which are two satellites from the European Space Agency, 
and the planet satellites, um, which I can't remember the last count exactly, but well over 100 satellites. So one of the advantages of planet is the just sheer number of satellites that they've got. Um, we get um, generally at least one coverage a day. It can be up to four or five as they increase the number of satellites up there. But the thing is they've been sending newer and newer technologies up each time they do a launch. And so there are now three different models of planet satellite up that I'm aware of, each with different cameras. And this results in slightly different results in the dry matter algorithm. And it would be nice if we could just take whatever satellite was giving us information and produce a consistent result out. Um, so there's a product that Planet have announced at a recent conference called Planet Fusion, which is where they combine all the satellite results for a given day and just give you a consistent result for that day each day. Um, so we're going to be investigating that when it's released. Um, if uh, that turns out to be not feasible, then I see a lot more work with equations in my future. <laughs> and um, the effects of terrain. So if you've tried space on very steep hills, you're going to notice that it can um, be a little um, erratic in its estimations. So that's something we want to address. And so that's space four. That's sort of the next few cabs off the rank, let's call it. Um, as for what the future looks like beyond that, um, we don't really see an end point for space. There's no sort of, um, right, we're done, let's sit back and, and relax. Um, and I'll just fit that company tagline in again. There's always room for improvement. Um, the other thing is we're young. So um, we're still a very young product. We have a lot to do. My to-do list is not empty. And um, there's, there's still plenty of things that we can investigate out there. And the last thing is that the technology is always moving forward as well. Planet are putting these new satellites up. And there's satellites up there at the moment that we're not accessing, but um, high resolution imagery. So the, the CubeSats we've got at the moment are sort of three meter pixels, but the stuff out there that's down to sort of 30 and 50 centimeter, um, if we were willing to fork out the money at the moment, we could be counting cows in the paddock, but it's not economically feasible at the moment to do that. But who's to say one or two, three years down the track that imagery gets cheaper and we start being able to do things like that. So that's, that's yeah. What does the future look like? And it's hard to say at this point. Um, and I'll finish with thank yous as well. These are the thank yous, in fact, that I'm contractually required to present <laughs> in any situation where we are talking about the, the pasture growth forecaster and its data. But I think this differs from most situations and that a lot of the people responsible for this are, in fact, in the room with me. This probably won't always be the case. Um, so I have uh, gotten through this in about half my allotted time. I hope no one's upset about that. Um, yeah. Good. So that leaves a bit of room for uh, questions, Grant. Um, uh -huh. I think there was a problem. With so uh, techno just check the technology. Can we get zoom up so we can see the people who are? Um, can we show z zoom so that we can see the people who who might want to raise their hand the or ask questions on the chat? Um, see how you go with that. <laughs> uh, but while, while you're um, battling the technology, um, so two years uh, it was from when we sort of first met to actually finishing the project. Some would say it's a, a lot of time. But actually, in t those two years, a lot of decisions were made, Grant. Um, we didn't know where it was going. We didn't know where the sweet spot was. What do you think was important from... Uh, being a research scientist to actually have a, an end target like that, getting it done in two years, what, what do you think you, you had to really uh, do well? That's it's just an, an easy question to so. solve. Well, you say easy, but you're <laughs> asking it, not answering it. <laughs> so um, one thing was communication. So um, as you mentioned earlier, it wasn't just sort of R&D talks to Rosier, that's it started with um, commercial and R&D talk to Rosier, but there was um, a lot more going on after that and there had to be a um, reasonably frequent connection between commercial technology, R&D, Rosier, all or any of those at any given time. And I think we need to be reasonably sort of, is agile the word I want? Quick in our response to, to changes. Yeah, I think that's probably it. 
Um, so is there any questions from the audience? Yeah, Mark. Um, check one, two. Ooh, that's good. Um, <laughs> The um, satellite data um, provision, um, so is that quite a competitive market? Like as the new satellites are going up, you know, is the price, um, you know, is the price coming down for the data that you need? Um, I'm going to throw that to someone else in the room. I don't know whether it's Rebecca or Kirk. Um, um, so the price, price, so not yet, but <laughs> Yeah, so in regards to satellites, we've looked at alternative options and to be honest, there's not a lot out there. And there was originally a couple of companies that were out there, I can't remember their names, that have gone under. So Planet has sort of got a bit of monopoly on that market. Um, the advantage that LIC has is that we are, as Grant said in his presentation, we're partnered with Farm Shots, who is Syngenta. So we're coupled in their sort of um, agreement that they have with planet so if we were out by ourselves then the cost to us would be a lot more expensive so that was like a strategic um, decision that we made um, but then the other thing we're looking at is alternatives to um, satellites so I suppose the other option for satellites is either aeroplanes we originally started with drones and wasn't so successful and then you've got the high what are they called Rebecca the high altitude UAV yeah high altitude UAV so I suppose that's what the alternatives are Any other questions? Warren. Yeah, thanks, oh, Miranda. Um, James Allen, AgFest. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Um, Grant, where, where do you see it heading with sheep and beef in particular? Um, you, you acknowledge the issues with slope, so what's your thinking on that? Um, I think we'd like to address those issues with slope and I guess look at that space. Um, Rebecca? What's that? We have a project in progress at the moment looking at slope. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Work in progress though, so no time frames. And we do, I guess, have a couple of sheep and beef people that sort of signed up for the system, so it, it's seeing use, but yeah, we really want to address those slope issues. Warren, is your question still? Mm -hmm. uh, Grant, notwithstanding your comments about the um, the well-deserved scepticism around farmers providing um, any input into this. I, I actually wonder if there's, um, I wonder if there's actually a, a value in that. So whether it's uh, whether it's grazing days, whether it's uh, a DEM, whether it's uh, farm walk data or a seed ax, um, you know, pasture layer, uh, um, G GPS uh, corrected particularly would be uh, would be interesting. Um, I wonder if you think, well firstly, um, is there any value of that in terms of the ability to, uh, to, to generate more accurate estimates of, of pasture going forward, but also whether there is any value in terms of a, of a marketing opportunity? You know, do you, would, would, um, would space have a, uh, have a broader market if there was the ability for farmers to provide that kind of data in, in some sort of regular or semi-regular fashion? Yep, so I am never one to turn down data, so I'd um, I'd be happy to have that data coming in and be able to use it. Um, at the moment, uh, space data for land and feed customers does go into their land and feed system and they can also do their own measurements and put data in there. So that data is available to us, although I don't think we make use of it in terms of, uh, I guess, the PGF integration in any um, significant fashion at the moment. Um, that might be quite interesting to look at going forwards. And I guess also I haven't gone and checked how many people are still providing data now that they're on space because I know that we saw a sort of drop in people doing their own measurements and putting data in the system once space was out there and they could use it. Um, in terms of grazing data, again, yes, that would be awesome. Um, and it would, I have said in the past, it would be nice if we could sort of motivate that by saying this is the sort of accuracy you see from the model if you provide us with grazing data against if you you know if we don't have that grazing data and that might be the sort of thing that actually gets farmers to go hey I can actually get value out of this we might only catch the what would we call what we're calling them before grazing enthusiasts or something like that the, the ones who are really invested in it already um, I don't know if that would reach the, the sort of mid to tail end of the market 
Um, does that answer? Is there any questions coming through Zoom? Ah, Chris. Um, one of the uh, things the industry is short of is long-term pasture growth data at individual sites. And so I'm just wondering if there's any thought going into capturing uh, data so that we get more long-term uh, information about pasture growth at particular locations. Um, that, may, that question may be a little bit out of left field, but <laughs> it's current for me. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'd say we're not throwing any of this data away, so it, it's all going into the database and one of my sort of long-term wish lists is to actually pick up that data that we're capturing and do useful things with it. Um, so once they, they get a bit of a window in the work I'm doing on space at the moment, it would be nice to actually get the sort of big data analytics side of things and, yeah, examine that. Yeah, um, I, uh, I totally think um, we should do something in that space. I've got some ideas. But, um, you talk about the satellite, the um, uh, pixel size getting down like to higher resolution. Um, should we now, um, with our quadrats where we cut pasture, should we now be measuring those with RTK, high accuracy GPS stuff that only costs a thousand bucks, should we be measuring that now to give you the pixel level calibration data? I refer you to my answer to the previous gentleman. I never turned down data. So. <laughs> uh, well, but I'm looking for something concrete. Is, is the, are the measurements being made now from satellite such that we should be collecting that data now? So the planet's stats on their accuracy are sort of three metre pixel size, but there's a bit of wobble in terms of where that picture actually is relative to specification. So I guess it would depend on how large those quadrats were to be. Um, so I don't know the precision of the sort of 0.5 metre stuff and I don't know when we'd start having that and I don't know if we would have historical access to it to get the measurements that you're doing now. But in saying that it takes a while to build up a backlog of mm. information for the future so in terms of future proofing the answer is probably yes. Yeah, so look forward to a capex. Um. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, just just looking at time, uh, we'll uh, finish there. Thank you very much, Grant. Uh, I'd like the, the audience to show their appreciation.